today on this episode of Between the Lines, the beauty of random human encounters with one of Hollywood's great still photographers, Robert Zuckerman. I'm Barry Kibrick. With his beautiful photo book titled Kindsight, Robert Zuckerman turns everyday experiences into profound visual testaments, showing his appreciation for the extraordinary nature of ordinary people. Each photo is paired with a personal explanation of the encounter and reveals the raw emotions and intimate beauty of our daily lives. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. I don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. Oh. And that is the person who can do. Robert, welcome to the show. I'm going to begin by something I guess I, I, I've adopted. This is now my new catchphrase, and it's the way your book almost starts itself out. It's by your friend, Andre Ridgway. Mm -hmm. And he says, if it gets in the way, it is the way. And then you add these words. These 10 words changed my life and are very much at the core of this collection. And after I even heard that, the first thing I did, I was telling you earlier, my son is into photography now at school, and I read him that line, and I said, we've got to pay real close attention to that line. If it's in the way, it is the way. Yes. Um, well, that's, uh, that's very true. And it was just something, uh, we, you know, Andre uh, and I used to sit around at night um, at a uh, Cafe Luna on Melrose, and uh, he's a, a tarot card reader, and he would go around and read people's uh, you know, tarot cards. And then afterwards, I'd join him, and we'd sit around and drink wine, or he'd have a cigarette. And he turned around and said it to me one night, and it just kind of hit me like a, I don't know, like an arrow or a bell. And well, you know, because the book is comprised of photos, which the viewers are going to see, and then words that you, I, you describe how that photo came about, because it is a documentary photo book, even though your world wide known for the work that you do on Hollywood films as a still photographer. This are interesting people you might have met in a taxi mm -hmm. cab, in a, a Walgreens, wherever the case might have been. So we're going to juxtapose the words and the pictures. And one of them I want to start with is, before we even get into the photos, there's a few okay. words that are uttered by a Jonathan Mostow. And I want to mm -hmm. talk about these. And it is, see the world as it is seen, he says about you with a fragile, nurturing place where hope is found in the eyes of all. And you can't help but go through this and get this sense of glory almost that you feel and that you capture in these little moments, these unheralded moments of meetings with people in all walks of life. Yes. That's um, uh, just how things are. I mean, uh, part of what Jonathan says and what uh, I've read before is uh, how you see the world is how it becomes. And it's been said in many different ways by many different people, but it's all about how you see things. It's an old cliche about half empty or half full. And I just found that, um, especially in the wake of 9-11 and this whole specter of terror that's in our lives, is that if you recognize and just be open to what's in the moment, the world becomes a totally rich place. Well, you know, your friend Nancy Bishop wrote words, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase them for yeah. a moment, but what she says you do is you really draw out the similarities that we all have rather than the differences yeah. that seem to be what's hyped up all the time in all forms of media. You notice the similarities, which by the way, no matter what you believe, most of us really do have way more similarities, very few differences in, in real regards. Yeah. Well, I found that to be true, and I, but uh, a lot of times the way you get to that is just by addressing that in people or by acknowledging it. And um, uh, again, that's something that's been said many times. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita talks about how self is everywhere and you can see it in the eyes of all creatures. And um, I've just found that to be true. If I stay open and uh, I'm open to people in the moment, um, that's kind of the approach I've taken in photography, even from the very beginning, is to be more open rather than be more directorial, even when I do headshots or portraits with people. 
uh, just to be more receiving. You know, you, you put that quote uh, of the Bhagavad Gita in the book, and you put it with a picture of Sam the cat. I, if I'm correct, am yeah. I right? Because you said <laughs> all good. beings, and I remembered yeah. it now because it was not a human being, it was a cat being yeah. there. And my wife, who just adores cats, I, I, in fact, I haven't shown her the picture yet even, yeah. I want to, but you even drew it out of this cat. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. I don't know, yeah, it's, uh, it's true. It's, um, but I found that to be with, uh, with other things too. On one time I had a neighbor who uh, acquired a white dove on the set of a music video. And she had the dove in her apartment, and it was in a little tiny cage. It was obviously something she really didn't know what to do with it. And uh, she was going to let it go out into the wild. And uh, I sat there with that dove one day, and we just kind of locked eyes. And I felt like it was for like a half an hour we somehow connected on some level. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm welling up here. I just told you my wife loves cats, right? Yeah. We have over 30 doves. Oh, my God. And it was the same way. Yeah. One of my cats caught a dove, mm -hmm. and she didn't know what to do with it, but... She now has this relationship. I built her an aviary, and she has oh this relationship yeah. with doves. And I said I felt we were kindred spirits, <laughs> and now it, it seems too true. <laughs> it's the dove thing, yeah. Well, I, yeah, and then uh, I had that dove for about four or five months, and then it began laying eggs, and that's why I realized, well, I have to... <laughs> that's why we have 30 of yeah. them now. Yeah, I don't yeah. mean, they was there like rabbits. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they go at it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, because I traveled, I ended up having to find other homes for them, and uh, because they are they are pretty high maintenance. Oh, uh, you got to. Uh, but I love them, you know. So. Oh, don't let's not. We, we're going to get off yeah. that subject. My wife, I could just hear her right now. She's going. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, Deborah Winger, because you do do uh, so many of the Hollywood films. Yeah. She has a comment in here about second glances. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I wanted to talk about that because this is an interesting. It's not even a dichotomy. I don't even know what you would call this. But the photos, as the viewer of the photos, the more you glance at them, and, and not only your photos, I would think of anything. The more you look, the deeper you want to get into it, the more you see. And she brings that out of what you bring out of these photos. Yet there's an element in all of the photos that almost seems like you caught them in a moment without thinking mm -hmm. of a second glance even. And I was curious if that, th th what that was for you, because there was an essence of each photo that was caught in a specific moment of time. Mm -hmm. It didn't take you a second glance, and yet for the viewer of the photo, it may be a second, third, or even a fourth glance. Yeah. Well, a lot of the photos emerged, as I say, they were very organic. It could be riding in the taxi to an airport, or a father and son walking by me in a market. And um, because, I guess, of my experience working in, uh, on, a, on, on set uh, and grabbing moments on a movie set, I felt uh, comfortable talking to these people. And as this project began to develop, uh, you know, moments would come up or would be in the middle of a conversation, and I would always uh, have a little camera on my belt. In fact, today I feel a little naked. I don't have it because I actually left it with the publicist on this movie that I came from uh, in my absence. But I would just uh, ask the person, you know, do you mind? And I kind of take it out and just have it there. And I say, do you mind? And m most of the time, people didn't mind. And so the moment evolved without really them being prepared for it or about, you know, it wasn't a posing situation. You know, I've kept them waiting long enough. I want to start bringing in the pictures and okay. actually talk about them right. and, and some of the comments that you, you write about them. Okay. And the first one, as I said, I felt a kindred spirit with you. And uh, your grandma, Evelyn, oh, yeah. and Grandpa Charles. I had a grandma, Evelyn, as well. And oh, it's the goodness. first picture in the book. And I was really going, boy, this is too, too freaky for me. But yeah. there's this picture in the book of Evelyn and Charles, your grandparents. Yeah. And I, I wrote these words down because when I finished the book, I noticed that there seems almost a real sensitivity within you that you're comfortable standing on the shoulders of giants. All those that have come before you seem to give you a lot of strength, the way you talk about them in all of the photographs. Yeah. Well, yes, my grandparents, um, uh, they were an inspiration to me. They still are. And um, it's funny, we all have uh, little rituals. It's funny that you mentioned that. Like when people go on plane, like I have a, a, a new friend who's uh, a Catholic, and she says, you know, before I get on, she, I get on a plane, she says, make sure you do the cross, uh, or whatever. My ritual when I go on a plane is I kind of summon all my ancestors around me, and you know, I kind of visualize them holding the plane aloft, and and I connect with them a lot. Like uh, sometimes I even uh, look in the mirror in the morning, 
and I can almost see my grandfather smiling back at me. Oh, it's a, I, I said you, you can tell that. There, yeah. There's an essence of your work that you can, it, I guess you're an artist, all of that f you know, filters through your pores no matter, no matter what you do. Yeah. Another picture, William Harris. And oh, that yeah. sometimes, by the way, the picture catches my eye, but it's the words I want to play off of. Yeah. And so you could play off the words or the picture. It's okay. uh, no different to me, okay? Yeah, yeah. William Harris. Whatever you put out, he says, these are yeah. his words, that's what you're going to get back. Mm -hmm. And again, the book is called Kind Sight. You put out a lot of kindness in your work. I felt that although he was the one discussing it, it was describing a bit of your essence. I think so, yeah. I had another uh, nice email from a gentleman in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, who had, because uh, I put my email address in the back of the book in case people want to contact me, and this gentleman contacted me and he, uh, his comment, he, s he found the book in his local Barnes and Noble and got into it and uh, he said that the camera points both ways and, uh, or the lens points both ways. So I, I think that has something to do with it as well. Do you know what is, uh, if you'd like, would you like to give out your email address if people if seeing this would want to get in touch with you? Oh, absolutely. Go right ahead. I usually do that, right. but I'm going to let you do I'm it. I'm not sure which one I put back there, but an easy one to remember is robert at robertzuckerman.com. Okay, so it's yeah. robert at robertzuckerman.com, right. and we'll sh leave it up there for a few seconds and, okay. and the viewers can see that. I have a spam blocker on there, so they just should identify themselves. Uh, you know, it's one of those crazy... <laughs> I'm sure yeah, they yeah, will. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah, they yeah, will. Yeah. Salim and Ali. Yes. And again, uh, interesting dichotomy of things because they almost, one of them almost looks like he could have been a gangster rapper, and mm -hmm. the other is a gentleman with one arm. But again, these words, just dealing and prevailing. Mm -hmm. Boy, so many of your subjects seem to imbibe that sentiment. Yeah. Well, again, uh, if it gets in the way, it is the way. But I found that... Um, uh, especially, well, we'll get on probably talk about my sister a little bit later, but... Um, oh, no, that's the next one, oh, okay. so go right ahead. Uh, we'll just put up the picture I was going to use. Go uh, ahead. That everyone has a story. The more people I talk to, you know, you deal with people on the surface. Even uh, years ago, uh, my mom got into a situation where she got in debt, and I was helping her negotiate her way out of the debt, and I was talking to a lot of creditors on the, on the phone. And usually when you talk to collection agencies, they're very, they're not very nice. But I talk about a little bit about my disabled sister, and then some of them, uh, a couple of times, people go, "Yeah, well, my father-in-law is disabled," and we get in a whole long conversation. I so said, once you kind of get through a barrier with people uh, and get past the surface and have a little bit of conversation, again, many people, almost everyone has a story, and many people have that in common. Well, in fact, with the pictures of your sister, you have her once with um, uh, the talk show host. Montel Williams, Montel Williams right. and you have her with, your, with a number of cases, but she's your inspiration, as you say in the book, and in one of the pictures where you see your sister before her disability, she's on top of a car, yeah. and then there is the situation where she's almost looking out. I couldn't tell if it was a car. I don't remember, yeah. but sh you can see that it's not the same vivacious look that she had on the car, and they're yeah. on the same page, but you use a quote, and I forgot the person whose quote it was, but I remember the quote, and I wrote it down. You won't discover the limits of the soul however far you go. Oh, her, her, Heraclitus? Yes. Heraclitus. You won't discover the limits of the soul however far you go. And you've gone pretty far and wide, Robert, so I'm assuming that that's at least the truth for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. I've uh, found that, and, and for myself and for others, but... Um, Again, I've, I've seen a lot of people and uh, dealing in the disability world, there's many people who haven't had any contact with that, who all, when they see someone in a wheelchair, they can't, they can't kind of handle it, you know. And um, I've just found that uh, there really are no limits to the soul and life has value no, however far you go into it. You know, you, uh, there's a picture that I, and again, I love the sentiment of this one, where your mom and your sister are with a woman from Walgreens. Yes. And you say that angels, and it's just following on that notion that angels are also found in the strangest places. Mm -hmm. And then you put especially at a Walgreens, as if it's <laughs> not just at a Walgreens, yeah. but especially so. Yeah. Well, in that case, it was with Mildred. Um, literally, she would, uh, we would be in there, and she, get, she worked at the photo counter. She doesn't work there any longer, but she worked at the photo counter, and as soon as she saw my mom or my sister, regardless of how many customers they had, she would come out from behind the counter, just kind of dance over and give them hugs. And that's just the nature of that. And I've just found that people, or even uh, being at a, uh, pulling up in LA at a stoplight 
and looking over in the corner and seeing someone make eye contact with you, and I've sort of had that feeling too. Maybe that person is there. Is some, there's some type of divinity to that uh, encounter. I have two favorites. Believe it or not, your self-portrait is one of them. I'll, oh, I'll yeah. discuss my other one later because there seemed to have been, when you look at this, I'll tell you what it was. For me, there was, a tr and I don't know even if the camera's going to pick this up, my camera, your yeah. camera does, but I'm not sure ours will, the layers of it. Yeah. Because you're, you seem to be reflecting within a reflection within a reflection. Yeah. And there were so many layers of that photo taken at a time from your hospital bedroom mm -hmm. that I could just tell so many of those same layers were just overwhelming you almost at that time. Yeah. Well, again, the story is I was in the hospital um, with a uh, thing they call cellulitis in my arm, and I spent 10 days in a hospital. And that was my first walk out of the room. I was actually going to uh, go to another floor and find a vending machine. And um, it was at dusk. And uh, I looked out through this big window out over the, the city of Miami. And the lights were coming on. It was what they call magic hour in the film world, where you can see the lights of the buildings, but the sky is still visible. And then I saw myself in my hospital gown reflected in the window, kind of blending in. And I couldn't tell where one began and the other ended. Well, that, and that's and what so, I found fascinating yeah. about it, too. And at first, I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out where are you even, because yeah. I looked at the picture first before I read it, and I'm going, where is he with this thing? Yeah. Yeah, wow. so it was, uh, it was interesting. And um, uh, even in the hospital, I, I, made a, I, I had a little point-and-shoot camera by, by the bed, which is what I use for that self-portrait. And I kind of made a whole series of all the nurses and the doctors that came into the room. Uh, now, you know, one of the pictures that you have called Amigos. Yeah. And it's just, this is really, in my opinion, one of the, just a simple photograph of a father and son. Yeah. But you observe them in the store. Yeah. And you write about this bond that they had. And you really wrote about the joy the father had in being with his son. I just found that. Yeah. And, and at the same time, I, I wanted to, if you feel uncomfortable with this, we'll just photo, concentrate on the photo. But there was nothing about your dad in the book, and I was wondering about that. Is there, uh, was a dad in your life at an early age? Was there a father presence? I mean, you have a father, but was that in there? Well, it was. It's interesting that you, that you pick up on that, because my parents um, got divorced when I was very young, and uh, I was less than a year old. So I went with my mom up to New York. And this, I was born in Florida, and then I didn't see my dad again, my, my biological dad, until I was 16. And so we picked up our relationship at that time. I had a stepfather in the intervening years. And, um, uh, you know, now my dad and I, you know, it took us a few years to kind of get in sync, but we're incredibly close and incredibly alike in a lot of ways, although we have a lot of differences. But there's something about us that's very close. Uh, so he's definitely a presence in there. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Because when you wrote about these amigos and you wrote about this father's uh, impression of his son and, and what he was yeah. feeling, you could just... I sensed something was there. I wasn't sure what it was, but yeah. something was there. Yeah. Well, my dad and I get along really well, and he's, he's um, he actually, and, I, and I, you, know, you know how things happen. I mean, he's a really good photographer, even though we never had a, a dialogue and he never picked up a camera and showed me. I think somehow I uh, genetically inherited it from him. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, there's also a theme, in my opinion, that underscores this. It's a bit of your love life. And, or I should say, a little bit lack of it. I mean, you were open about that. And there was a picture of, of, of a Daniel Lurie, mm -hmm. and she was an assistant that came yeah. on the set. And in my words, I was going, Robert, how come you guys never hit it off? I <laughs> mean, she was, she was the, the, you could just see she, you, you, the way you describe her even in the photograph, you can see she is beautiful. And she even, I'll, I'll, you know what, I'm not going to even jumble up the other thing I wanted to talk about with you wrote about that. I'll, I'll just la leave it on there. There's a little bit, you leave us with little hints of yeah. your love life through this. Well, also, I think part of what it is, is, is as a photographer, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, obviously you have to be professional what you do, but in order, in my art, I, I fall in love, like when I look through the lens, there's, a, there's an element of falling in love, and not, not just with beautiful women, but also with life and with people that I, that I come in contact with. Well, she does use, a, I, I, again, this is one that you'll have to tell me if it's a line that she used, the line that you used. Mm -hmm. It is a line I've heard, but it's something that I think, again, I, I'd like to share with the viewers. And it's, I want to get it exactly, and it's start before you're ready. Yeah. So many people are always waiting yeah. for what they call just the right time. Yeah. And your photographs in particular are those, 
happenstances that happen at any given time. So I thought that quote was especially relevant to the work you do. Well, again, I don't know about you, but, I, but through my life, you know, like the, uh, if it gets in the way, it is the way kind of thing, there's about maybe a dozen quotes that people have said to me that could be really like a survival book in life. And that's something that someone said to me once on a film set, uh, a, a sound mixer who wanted to be, had secret aspirations of being a director, but because his uh, two sons in college and he'd been divorced, he had to keep working as a sound mixer. And one day, actually it was Warren Beatty, he was working on a film with Warren Beatty, and Warren Beatty said that to him. He said, start before you're ready. And I've transmitted that, I've conveyed that to a lot of people, including Danielle, and she's taken that totally to heart because since that time, She's made two short films. Her second short film is, was an award-winning film that was shot completely in Turkish about honor killings. And now she's just been hired to uh, direct her first feature for Universal Films because she started before she's, she was ready. Uh, you know, I, I totally believe in that, and I try to encourage my kids to do that yeah. and others who I meet. Don't wait for the right moment. Just right. start. You don't have to be ready. You'll catch up to yourself. Yeah. You know, I have another thing. I'm uh, sort of on a crusade lately. Okay. And uh, Let's hear it. Let's have it's, it. <laughs> it's my show. I can be on yeah. a crusade, you know. Um, caregivers. Yeah. Uh, my mother in law now has a caregiver. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been just something I've noticed. We, they are the unsung heroes of our society, whether they are caring for the elderly, whether they're in the nursery at the hospital, whether they're taking care of your wounds, whether they're on the battlefield. Caregivers. I can't mention enough, and there's a beautiful picture of the caregiver that's taking care of your sister, right. and I just, again, wanted to reflect upon it because they seem so important in, in making the society a better place for us all. Yeah. Well, it's true, and um, I guess like school teachers, you know, they're kind of underpaid for the value that they give in life, and um, Joy, who uh, has been with us now, my sister, for about five years, just someone who selflessly comes every day, and she does it because, I know she does it because of her personal belief, her personal spirituality and her belief, in, and uh, she's really become like a family member for us. Um, you know, I would love to add a number of zeros, you know, to the salary that we give her. Oh. Uh, and even then it would still, yeah. you, you, you could never compensate yeah. for that care. Oh yeah, it's invaluable. And um, another gentleman, like I told you about the uh, man from Ephrata, Pennsylvania, someone else locally here, uh, found the book and wrote me through my email address that he wants to do a, uh, he wants me to get involved with him doing a book about nurses for oh. the same reason you know oh, definitely I, I'll have you back if you do okay okay, okay. You got <laughs> <it>. <laughs> now Robert you know before we we end this show and almost I want to get to my favorite picture and okay. it's called it, it, as I said I wrote wow but you'll know which picture it is it is this picture of the sky mm -hmm. you even call it a wonder alert oh, yeah. and you talk about the Planetary Wonder Agency oh, yeah. and how they're keeping track of, of all of the, the kind things that go on. And, and in this particular photo, as the viewers are looking at, you bring out a quote from Don Juan Mateus, the warrior's art is to balance the terror of existence with the wonder of existence. Yeah. And Robert, I can't help but think that is, you're a warrior to that extent because you're part of playing that role in that balance. Right, it's just, uh, I, I guess so, yeah, the, the role that I'm playing is to try and show people that this is possible and to, uh, yeah, to show that viewpoint. And um, also with the, uh, again, the specter of terror that we have, I believe in the long run that the serum for that is to be open and to recognize that there is wonder in the world in everyday life. And you, I think, even hit that home when you were visiting your mom and your sister during one of the hurricanes. There's yeah. a photo. And in fact, it's very funny because I would never have known that there was a hurricane going on. There is such a stillness because I guess the drops that you're seeing must have not been in the hurricane. They must have been on the inside of something. I can't figure it out if there's a hurricane raging and that photo was was being taken. Well, it was, a, it was a car window, but it was kind of in the aftermath. We had been evacuated uh, from... We live uh, in Miami, very close to the ocean, so they gave a mandatory evacuation, and we went to a hotel, you know, pretty far inland. So we didn't catch the real, uh, you know, the full force of the hurricane. It was like a, just a pretty bad storm. Well, you know, you, you, you talk about rain being sort of the tears of, of, of God to, to some yeah, extent, yeah. and you actually ask a question of us, and if you don't mind, I'm going to just throw it back at you. Okay. What is it, then, that gives us buoyancy in the depths 
and footing in the torrent. Yeah. Well, Robert, you, you put the book together, Kind Sight. What is it that gives us that buoyancy? I think we go back to Heraclitus' quote of, uh, you won't discover the limits of, so of the soul however far you go. And I don't think you know until you've been there. So uh, it's, the, it's the spirit. Ah. Well, spirit. Robert, I want to thank you so much for sharing your spirit thank you with us much. today. Oh, it is my you. pleasure. And thank you for joining us. Now, before Robert leaves, I would like to leave you with these words from Kind Sight. Somehow, by pausing, by breathing, and being open to so-called ordinary encounters, moments and experiences that might otherwise be glossed over, the world reveals its extraordinary beauty, divinity, and grace. I'm Barry Kibrick. By pausing, breathing, and being open, you get to see clearly between the lines, and that is where beauty, divinity, and grace resides. Thank you, Robert. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. If you'd like a tape of our show or would like to become a member of our book club and receive our weekly email show updates, just write us at barrykibrick at AOL.com.